Hello everyone. Good morning. My name is Lars Arne Jensen and I'm a research program manager at the NIDA Fellowship Center and I will be your host on this Knowledge in Action talk today. On behalf of the NIDA Fellowship Center, I'm really delighted to extend a warm welcome to this KIA talk with the subject Equitable Partnerships. And the talk will be live streamed at the DFC's LinkedIn profile, the YouTube, Facebook and also X, formerly known as Twitter. So, Every researcher working in a collaborative research project between the Global South and the Global North knows how great it feels to produce new knowledge uh, together and learning from each other, not least. However, researchers also know that working together can be really a challenge and that they need to deal with multiple power dimensions. We know that collaborative research is needed but frameworks in collaborative research and knowledge production between the North and the South are lopsided and needs to be re rethought and restructured. The idea and content for this KIA talk came about from a, when a group of researchers, about 50 researchers actually, gathered in Arusha uh, earlier this year for a three-day seminar to address these issues. It was called the Danita Fellowship Center Science Engagement Days, and the, and the purpose was exactly to explore how to address, address, discuss, and overcome structural power imbalances in research collaboration and partnerships, and how better to produce impactful research knowledge. Researchers from Danita-funded research projects were invited to share experiences, knowledge, and considerations. In this key talk, we will take up from what we learned from those days, and we will discuss the power dimensions in the North-South research partnerships. We will try to explore the four topics. Why do we need more equitable research partnerships? How do we work together for more equality in authorships? How do we deal with financial aspects and imbalances? And how do we craft more Southern-led research agendas and knowledge? <clears throat> During the session, if you have questions or comments for our facilitators, who I'll introduce you to in a brief moment, do feel free to post it in the chat uh, so that we can share it with everyone. And we will try our very best to respond to your comments and questions as we go along. So about our facilitators, to, uh, about our participants today, we are really happy and lucky to have two guests with us in very different ways and under very different circumstances, their experience and knowledge <clears throat> shows that equitable partnerships are possible. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to our two guest facilitators. First of all, Sarah Sali, as she's an associate professor and dean of the School of Gender Studies at Makareda University in Uganda. And we also have Charles Hunt, he's an associate professor in the School of Global Urban and Social Studies at RMIT University, Melbourne, Australia. And Sarah, you're with us from Kampala, and Charles, you're with us from, uh, from Moshi in Tanzania. So welcome to both of you. It's great to have you on board. And before we actually dive into the more substance, I'd really like to ask you to introduce yourselves and also to address why you are investing time and efforts in discussing equitable partnerships. So Sarah, over to you first, please. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Sarah Sally. As you've had introduced, I'm an associate professor and dean of the School of Women and Gender Studies at Macquarie University. I am also the, the, the director Center of Notion of Identities in Africa. It's an Arua Center of Excellence. Uh, I hold a, a, a bachelor's in political science, a master's in gender studies, and a PhD in internet studies, which really looks at the political economy of health. I am interested in this particular topic because I've, I come with a world of experience working with different research consortia and uh, with that we have experienced a lot, some good, some bad, but it tells you that research is about power relationships and paying attention to these power relationships is key. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah. Thanks. And Charles, over to you, please. <clears throat> Yeah, thanks very much, Lazana. Um, lovely to be with you and Sarah to be alongside you again uh, after our meeting in Arusha. Um, as Lazana said, I'm an associate professor of um, global studies at RMIT University in Melbourne, Australia, but I'm also a um, senior fellow 
with the United Nations University Center for Policy Research. And my interest in this topic come about through both my academic work as well as some of my practice. So in my academic work, primarily on critical peace and development studies, I'm interested in how power relations manifest in the generation of knowledge and particularly in its application to those practices of peace building and development. So my academic work is not directly on the issue of development research partnerships, but I'm very interested in them. Um, and then secondly, I have a history of, of leading North-South development and peace building research partnerships. So I've been on behalf of institutions in the so-called Global North. I've worked with donors and partners in the Global South on uh, peace building and development research. So I've had some experience um, as a recipient um, managing up to donors, but also mediating between those institutional partners in the North and, and South. So in summary, I've both studied these dynamics and experienced them firsthand. So I've seen why they're both so important uh, and why there's so much to do to try and decolonize and, and to some extent reset these partnerships. Thank you very much, Sarah and Charles. Thanks for introducing and thanks for explaining why you're investing in this uh, Kia talk, not only Kia talk, but equitable partnerships as such. So let's dive into it. And Sarah, first over to you. <clears throat> why is it that we need equitable partnerships in research and why is it important to really have focus and discuss this topic? Thank you very much, Lars. Uh, I take it up from where Charles have just stopped. And it's really about the, the way the Global North and the Global South are structured within research partnerships. First of all, as academics and as development partners, a lot of research does get conducted. And uh, given our contextual and historical background, you find that the Global South, especially Africa, arrives at these partnerships in a very skewed way, sometimes in a very disadvantaged way. First of all, we have a post-colonial past, which comes with two things. One, that the way the academy is structured and the way the research industry is structured, is structured more looking towards the global north, more than looking to the issues that inform the context in which these institutions are built. And uh, then, of course, then you have the fact that after we gained independence, we went into a lot of struggles for independence, liberation and post-liberation. This in a way stalled our development economically, and that also in a way affected the academy in that many people left, but also many people stayed. But whichever way they stayed, and the different economic development models we have embraced, such as neoliberalism, which has pushed for more developmentalism, you end up finding that the Global South Academy and research group is more like an extension of the Global North. And it ends up looking, the architecture ends up looking like the thinking is done in the North, the application is done in the South. So the South becomes the space where knowledge is just extracted, where data is just extracted. And so there's not much investment there. Of course, the Global North has been reflecting on these matters. That's why we are having this, this debate or this discussion. It has been reflecting on these matters and the, the, the reflection has revealed that because the Global South is looked at as a space for extraction of data, not much has been invested in in terms of growing the grants offices, building capacity to be able to handle grants, building capacity to formulate the research questions and building other kinds of capacities. So you end up with research being full of power relationships, which are not advantageous to the global south, because of course the money is coming from the global north. So you have hierarchies of power from the beginning up to the end of the research process. So you have hierarchies of power in terms of determining what it is the research should focus on. So are the issues being focused on issues of concern to the context in which the Global South finds itself, or is it an issue from the Global North, but just being also applied to the Global South for comparison purposes? You find hierarchies of power in terms of funding, who gets to be the PI, 
who gets to be the co-PIs. You get hierarchies of power in terms of disciplines because the Global North interests tend to shape what is worthwhile funding in the Global South. For example, you'll end up with the sciences being advantaged, particularly medical sciences, and then the, the humanities, things talking about identity, things talking about culture, being shortchanged or saddled to the, to the margins. So you then also have hierarchies of power in terms of publications, in terms of that. So this is of importance to me because we engage with these hierarchies on a daily. And it's not that our Global North partners are not concerned. They are concerned. And that's why we are having this discussion on how we make research partnerships more equitable. Everyone's concerned. The funders are concerned. The global collaborators, the northern collaborators are concerned. So we have these kinds of conversations to reflect on how do we make the relationships more equitable than always having the Global South postured as a space for extraction. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Sarah. Thank you so much. Uh, it's really interesting to hear also this, uh, you're talking about hierarchies of power and uh, the South researchers being looked at as more or less development worker gathering data. It's, uh, yeah, something really needs to be done, eh? Charles, over to you. What is your take on uh, why do we need more equitable partnerships and why is it important to discuss uh, adding on to what Sarah already said, please? Yeah, thanks, Lazana, and and thanks, Sarah. I in, I couldn't agree more with what what Sarah's laid out there. I think she's made a really strong case for why we need equitable partnerships. Uh, and so, from me, in short, we need them because of the mutual benefits they bring. I think we can strip it back to some of the fundamentals. The benefits are manifold, and I think they're quite self-evident. But particularly around the innovative. Um, ontological approaches or epistemologies and then the methodologies through which we do the work. These are a little esoteric in terms of the, the words, but they really matter for research. How is it understood? How do we understand the world before we generate research designs and questions that um, might provide new knowledge through this co-production? So I think the benefits are, are, are so clear. I think the importance of focusing on this discussion, having a discussion about this topic is because they remain so inequitable. And that's in a number of ways. Um, Sarah touched on a few, but maybe to add a couple of thoughts, um, probably because, primarily because the funds come from the North, it's often Northern research institutions, perhaps even the donors themselves that define the focus of the research, as Sarah said. So they're in a way setting the agenda upon which methodological and theoretical approaches can apply. And to unpack that a bit more, what I mean is um, when the research projects are defined in the North, there's a significant risk that this precludes other imaginaries, other outcomes. And so the production of knowledge doesn't reflect necessarily the interests and perspectives of academics, of stakeholders in the global sector. And so these structures through which the grants um, are created, the programmatic frameworks or other imperatives that confine and limit the work according to Northern or Western centric frames um, can mean the results may be actually irrelevant or at least miss some of the vital points because of this framing, because the analysis of research projects and findings overlook key aspects of the local context and people's lived experiences. So I've seen this through my own experience. It can happen very inadvertently and in very unintended ways, but it, but it happens because of those implicit hierarchies that Sarah talked about. So it emerges where the knowledge and publications of North-based researchers end up dominating the process. And I think one of the more perverse effects this has is that it can incentivize Southern researchers to work with Northerners when there isn't necessarily a compelling reason to, and it can close out or crowd out other South-South relationships, which might actually be really important and productive, but otherwise not happen. So overall, I think inequity in these development research partnerships is so important um, to address because ultimately it can be corrosive. It kills morale, it can erode togetherness. And as one of our participants put it in our, our session in Arusha, 
it can suggest somehow implicitly that Southern partners should just stay in their lane. It's an unspoken reminder that collaboration is not really equitable. So a really important discussion. Thank you very much, Charles. Thanks a lot for uh, for elaborating even further. Staying in your lane, that's not a, that's really strong words. Uh, so definitely it's important to discuss these things. Um, so diving into uh, to, the, to the next topic on how we actually apply quality in authorship and how we better work together. Because one thing is to establish that we need equitable partnerships, but how do we actually go about it? Um, how do we work together and on which terms? Also, like you said uh, just now, Charles, regarding this, the funds maybe comes from the North and the North sets the, uh, the agenda, uh, leaving out the relevance somehow for the, for the South partners. Um, we all know that uh, publi uh, publishing uh, res research in acclaimed academic publications that matters for any researcher that it matters for your name on paper that your co-author and your co-publications it isn't just a small issue when it comes to collaboration before going into the discussion let's just hear what lecture agatha alidri and professor charles Kumu from gul university in uganda uh, said during a bench talk we had in arusha earlier today between North and South researchers. Why is this topic of importance? For an author to be part of a publication, that author, whether it's from the North or from the South, have to work together. When you conduct research, the end result is a publication, and that's a joint activity. Thanks to Agatha and Charles from Gould University. Um, and first, Sarah, over to you. What do you think, in your experience, how can co-authorship be a challenge in this South-North collaboration? And what do we do about it? Thank you very much, Lars. Authorship is a challenge because, first of all, we need to acknowledge that a lot of the work that we do as research will not make any sense except if it is out there and it is being read. It's no use doing research and keeping it to yourself. So authorship then becomes a very political process. And in this authorship, what we normally look for, of course, the one who gets to be the first author, there's politics around being the first author. There's politics around being the last author and being the corresponding author. So it is very, very, they, and you see the way journals are organized is that where the, the positionality of the name becomes, it's like an indicator of who did the biggest contribution or who was senior in that process. So authorship is important because one, it is a site of, a site of but it's also a challenge in that if you have not been a PI, or if, if the relationships are inequitable, or they are unequal, you'll tend to find that thousand researchers end up being in the middle, where they are neither rewarded as first author, nor as last authors, or as corresponding authors. So there is that. What is the credit you get in, for participating in a research process? Worst case scenario is you're excluded altogether, but that no longer happens. What happens now is you are included in a whole list of names and sometimes you can be included in the middle. That's another of silencing one's contribution. The best case scenario is to say, okay, these are the number of publications. How are we going to organize? And what I know is most research consortia reward those who did most of the work in developing the manuscript. So you would sit together, agree on a who is going to develop, how many papers are going to come up, who is going to take the lead in developing the papers, and that becomes the first author. So these days, that is, there's an attempt to have that being respected. So that is one thing around authorship. Who gets to get which credit by, who gets to get placed on which, in which position on the list of authors. The other thing about publication and authorship is that you end up having the journals themselves have their own politics. 
there are certain topics that are not of interest to the journals. You may, so if journals are mainly located in the global north and they are speaking to a particular audience, the challenge is will they find a topic of particular interest to Africa, for example, worth reporting on? Now, maybe if you're talking about cultural studies, probably, but sometimes on scientific things, let's say if you're talking about a, a disease which is of a particular kind of, a particular kind of disease to get cattle in Africa, that may not necessarily be of interest to Northern veterinarian scientists. So that becomes a challenge. So the issue of interest determines, the, I mean, the author, the journal publication interests determine what kind of work gets published out of the research partnership. And even if the Southern universities or African universities have moved on to have their own journal articles, their own journals, you find that they do not occupy what we call high impact positions, the way the Northern journals do happen. So you find inequality even at that level of dissemination that you can publish as much, but then since you're not in a very high impact, then you cannot be ranked that highly. So then what does that generate in terms of relationships in the global south? You have many southern researchers shunning the southern journals so as to publish in the north, and that becomes a challenge. Of course, there's also the whole issue of open access. You can get into a northern journal high impact, but it's not the information is not available because it's not open access to your students. So for now, I can leave it at that. But that's some of the politics around journal publication and how you can perpetuate the inequality from research into authorship and publication. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah. Thanks for addressing uh, this issue. It's uh, highly important and it's really strong words you come up with in terms of uh, mutual respect and the issue of also interests. Uh, um it's so definitely and charles i'd like to pass the floor to you to to give uh, you a chance to give your take on uh, authorship and co-authorship please sure thanks lazana and um, and again i agree strongly with with what sarah's just said um she makes it very clear that um co-authorship is important um but that there are challenges so yeah i agree it's essential i think co-authorships um, across institutional but also across cultural difference is fundamental to genuine collaboration and partnership. I think it's at the core and it can be part of overcoming some of the inequities. But there's a circular issue here. As you said, Lazana, it, it's a formal way of disseminating co-produced knowledge and recognizing contributions of, of authors. It's really important. But it can almost counterintuitively reinscribe some of the inequity for some reason sarah said but also some others this idea i think is a really important one that came up in our discussions in arusha about um the in the, the production of those publications not necessarily the names and who goes where but actually who does what so this idea of a two-tiered arrangement um, where often it's researchers in the global south countries who end up primarily mainly as the somehow the collectors or the providers of data um, and on the ground fixers even to use that term which is quite controversial and there's been been pushed back on but but somehow arranging things for northern scholars to do their work and in its most problematic form, um, but not most uncommon form, um, this leads to data grabbing where, where Global South researchers collect the data and sometimes in quite dangerous circumstances um, and may carry out parts of the analysis yet and not recognized fully as, as co-authors. So, so first it's about recognition um, and, and, and addressing those inequities. And Lazano, if I can just say one quick thing on what can be done about it, because that was part of your question. I think there are many things that can be done, but very quickly, first, I think from the Northern perspective, what I've seen, I think firstly, funders can do things to address the issues Sarah raised. They can shift the incentive structure around publishing in the way they formulate the grant calls and, and the rules and regulations. So commit to publishing articles in somehow regional or southern journals or open access ones in particular that might not hit the high metrics, but nevertheless qualify as really important deliverables for projects and push harder on funding to a, a funding line for open access. Um, there's also things that researchers can do and ultimately, and I'll finish here, Lazana, but it's really about us as researchers in, in somehow the north walking the talk. It's no good us bringing out, rolling out the rhetoric 
rhetoric around this and saying it's important without taking action. And sometimes there's sacrifices, there's compromises for us in terms of our objectives and key performance indicators. But we need to be willing to do that if we if we want to walk the talk. Thank you so much, Charles. Thanks a lot for addressing this even further. Like you also said, just the thing of being recognized for actually doing a lot of field work under sometimes dangerous circumstances. Uh, I mean, of course, you need to be recognized for that also in terms of authorship. So, uh, and like you say, encourage open access. That was also uh, one of the, the major topics in uh, in our in our talks in Russia earlier this year. So thanks a lot, Sarah and Charles, for addressing uh, this really important issue also, which is, of course, important for younger researchers and their future careers. So there's lots of topics to touch upon in the in the future discussions also amongst the funders, I'm quite sure. Thanks a lot. So let's move on, move on to the second uh, or next, uh, next item on the agenda, so to speak, regarding financing and financing aspects and uh, empower balances, so to speak. Because uh, uh, North, North and South Research Partnerships, of course, let's see how uh, Ben's talk with Charles uh, and also Agatha from Gulu uh, turned out in, uh, in Arusha earlier this year regarding how better to, uh, to make sure that the financing aspects are dealt with also in North-South collaborations. Associate Professor Charles, you facilitated a session financing research projects. What are the implications? What often happens when we look at development research partnerships is we have um, strong narratives and supportive comments around equity and, and justice. But when we drill down and look into the financial aspects, the budgeting, financial reporting, the accountability back to donors, that's where we see the power differential play out in sometimes a negative way. So often the ideas and the demands of Northern partners are imposed upon those in the South in ways which we don't expect as much or we don't see as clearly unless we look in detail at these financial but also institutional arrangements. Thanks, Charles, for giving us that bench talk with uh, together with Agatha. Really interesting. And just before I give you the floor, Charles, I'd just like to encourage our listeners and participants to use the chat for uh, for questions and comments. Uh, definitely, it's open, and we'll do our best to respond. But coming back to the financing aspect, Charles, um, in addition to what you already said in the video, is there anything concerning the North-South collaborations and financing aspects that you want to add on and elaborate on, please? Yeah, happy to. Uh, just briefly, perhaps, it'd be good to hear more from Sarah. You've heard from me already. But um, I think mm -hmm. what I said in our meeting was that sometimes it's the more mundane or banal parts of partnership agreements where these inequities are really caught up. So technical pieces like the monitoring and evaluation, the reporting and, and upwards accountability to donors. So these are the kind of modalities that they, firstly, they take up a lot of time and resources for researchers where it can distract sometimes from um, from from doing the real substantive research work. So that's one element to consider. But they more in a more kind of divisive or problematic way, they often constrain partners in the global south who are put under pressure to justify the use of funds towards these tangible deliverables and. This, in a way, reinscribes what is important for donors, not necessarily what's important for the researchers or for the research project itself. And so forecloses, perhaps, on other ways of generating and disseminating knowledge. So we're linking back to those bigger issues of inequity, but it comes through some of these more technical financial and accounting accountability mechanisms. The second thing, just very briefly, is, though, around questions of sustainability. So really difficult one for those in this triangular partnership to navigate because the funding can't, can't last forever. But the idea that there can be built into the design some way of following on the research, setting in place um, pathways for future funding 
bringing more government and, and, and perhaps regional support into follow-on projects that build on the foundation set by the initial grant. So I think, firstly, there are problems with the financing. It can reinscribe again these power dynamics, but there are things that can be done um, to address it. Thanks, Charles. Thanks for elaborating on this and also putting out some uh, some points for uh, for uh, thought uh, from the donor side on uh, on requirements and, and stuff regarding the finances. And Sarah, what's your take on the financing aspects in terms of uh, of this imbalance in the uh, north south collaborations? Thank you very much, Lars. I think Charles has spoken most of it, but what I can just say is sometimes you feel there's an issue of trust. It, sometimes it looks like when it comes to thousand partners, the people begin from the start from the point of distrust because, of course, our structures are not that very well developed, and because they are not that very well developed, most of these institutions have not held big amounts of money. So there's always that distrust. Will they manage? We want it to get lost. Want it? So then the research partnership becomes a relationship of proving trust, that you're trustworthy, that you're a researcher. I think that is one. Another small thing I can add on is the whole issue of not understanding the Southern contexts. Uh, Charles has spoken a lot about actually the heavy workload of Southern researchers, who in addition to research have to really fill in the financial templates of the donor. But also there's the issue of timelines. Things move differently in the north and in the south. And sometimes I think there's need to pay attention to the timelines and to the challenges that emerge in the research space. And in a way, if thousand researchers request for no cost extensions, I think sometimes that should be looked into. And the last one I could add on is we are beginning to see a demand for co-funding or counterpart funding. And the, most of the thousand, the big thousand institutions that are in the research industry are government funded. So it creates a challenge. If you're going to insist on counterpart funding, that means the government may have to put in, some governments have really put in, but they may also want to demand to see what the donor is putting in. And if they want to put it together, then that can create challenges where demands of donor money should also end up in the consolidated fund. So I think being alive to the challenges the context is very important. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah. Thanks a lot. Uh, it's really important issues that you're raising, both of you. And I can only uh, hope that, uh, that that donors will also uh, take up this issue and discuss on how to, from their side and from our side, better uh, better set set the uh, set the agenda for a, a more equitable. Uh, partnership in terms of also financial aspects. So thanks to both of you. Now, uh, we also just uh, touched upon in the beginning on the lopsided uh, relations and the power relations in the uh, research collaborations. And also the inherited structural inequalities between the North and the South that it gets in the way of truly global research collaboration. So what is actually behind the dynamics of inequalities in research collaboration between the South and the North? To address this, Sarah actually had a bench talk with Professor Christine Noé of University of Dar es Salaam at, uh, at the Science Engagement Days earlier this year in Arusha. So let's see this video and hear what they said. But I always enjoy your presentations. Your presentation about equitable partnerships in hierarchical knowledge system production was extremely useful. Could you summarize uh, how that um, would influence our thinking and the practices as well. Beyond the knowledge being researched about is a whole set of power relations. Those power relations are evident when we are doing the direct research, but they're also evident in what we decide to research on. They are also evident in the methods we use to research on and in many things. And why is this important for me? Because for long, the Global South and Africa in particular has been considered as simply consumers of secondary knowledge, not producers of their own knowledge. So if we are to be producers of our own knowledge, what do we need to do differently? We cannot just continue mimicking what the West has done. 
cannot just continue being native informers of what happens in the African context. We have to go further and produce primary knowledge that is different from what already exists. And how do we do this? We need to rethink how we do methods. But then, we are not the first people to think like this. Many people have thought like that. So why haven't they broken through? They have not broken through because of these hierarchical knowledge systems. That since the African university and research industry is an extension of the West, that's what counts as knowledge. That's what counts as theory. That's what counts as research, credible research. That's what counts as philosophy. Now, anything around that is seen as a mirror reflection of the other. So the Western knowledge systems are used to validate now, if you're going to do traditional medicine, for example, which can be validated as herbalism, it might be better off than, for example, spiritual forms of knowing and doing things. So until we deal with the hierarchical system of what counts as knowledge and how knowledge is produced, which is really an epistemological question, you cannot really talk about equitable partnerships. Thanks, Sarah. That's really an interesting bench talk you have with uh, Christine Noe there, and really strong words in this video, like the African universities are just an extension of, uh, of the North and Western universities, uh, and how do we actually deal with this, rethinking methods, etc. So, could you just add on a bit by guiding us, how do we actually make sure, or how can we make sure that collabor collaborative research projects, that they actually build on Southern-led research agendas and knowledge? Yes, thank you very much, Lars. Thanks a lot for that question. Um, like I said earlier, the Global North is equally concerned, like the Global South, so we are in this together. So how do we be go around this? One is to engage with the context. First of all, research problems are global, but also they are particular. And there are some research, global research problems which have a particular nuance. So having more co-creation meetings and engagements before the research finally rolls out is very important in ensuring that everyone's concerns are taken care of so or that the research will be relevant to all so that's one thing we can do and one way we can do this very well is if we integrate research teams to have more than a thousand partners at the at inception but not just the senior researchers especially the early career researchers I find this to be the people who are really buzzing with new kinds of knowledge. They are looking at things in a different way from the way older researchers have done it. So even when we are talking about co-creation, let it not just be the seniors getting together. That will have its space, but we should ensure that even the early career researchers get into the research projects to bring new angles of looking at a problem. Another way is also to have a lot of south-to-south -south collaboration. And the, again, because some of these things relate in a modern manner, but also relate, and when we come together south-to-south -to -south collaborators, then we shall relate better with the north to no, the northern research partners. And like the Arua, Arusha meeting was a very good way of showing how we had commonality among the southern partners in relation to our northern partners. And I believe we had a great meeting and what will come up out of that is going to be great research of relevance to the north as well as to the other thing which is very important is capacity strengthening. There's the capacity strengthening with regard to the researchers and this has occurred a lot. There's a lot of mobility visits. There's a lot of training that has gone on with various donors. But we are also now looking at capacity strengthening in terms of infrastructure. If, for example, the scientists are going to do good quality research and they are not going to just be data gatherers or gatherers of collectors of research samples, you will need to invest in laboratories in the global south so that the global the, the the southern researchers can do this research entirely on their own and also be credited for it so we are talking about capacity in terms of human resources in terms of grants offices in terms of lab research laboratories 
And in all of these things to actually keep the main issue, build relationships of trust. So I'd like to stop it there for now, but it is very, very important that we build capacity of infrastructure in addition to building capacity of the people. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah, for elaborating on this and giving your thoughts on the uh on uh, this topic. Charles, over to you. Can you please also add on to uh, to what Sarah just uh, mentioned and uh, give us your take on this? Well, it's always hard to follow Sarah and in many ways I feel I shouldn't try, but um, let me just say a couple of points um, really just agreeing with, with Sarah. It's my sense that um, this discussion is really important and, and it's great that this initiative is taking place, but I think we shouldn't underestimate the size of the challenge and the need for such transformational change to a, a long-term commitment and investment that it will take to break and undo some of these harmful relations. So it can't be lip service. It can't be, as I said at the, the workshop, simply rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic as it sinks. There'll be costs associated with this too. So it's not easy to sell to government agencies or taxpayers in, in the global north. Um, that will take time and significant political will, but it needs to be transformational. It can't be um, the window dressing to use another mixing my metaphors all over. But let me say though, that I don't think all hope is lost or that there's not um, things that can be done. I think the funders in the North can do certain things which will help enable what Sarah's talking about. It can be an enabler to address some of the things which are equally or more important, but often get left out of the funding. So budget lines for dissemination and research uptake activities at the end of research projects, often not written into the budget. And the expectation is somehow there'll be resources there to do this, usually not the case. Access to e-journals and, um, and things we've discussed already, but being creative around how to create space for this dialogue that Sarah talks about as being so important, often dismissed as talk shops or a waste of time. It's not this tangible output, but we know that that genuine exchange and mutual learning only happens in these spaces and it can't happen without resources. It costs money to do these things. So Northern funders need to keep that in mind and, and, and think through that and the implications. As for Northern researchers, what can we do? Well, I mentioned it, I alluded to it earlier. I think we need to use our privilege in our undoubted privilege in this power relation and take the hit a little bit, be willing to make a compromise and make a sacrifice. So it's things like shifting um, perennial patterns or undoing practices that, that perpetuate this problem. Things like hosting conferences, why not shift them to the global south? Of course, there are challenges associated with it, but um, this would overcome some of the impediments for involvement and participation of some of the Global South, South partners. Um, another one is if Global Northerners uh, tend to be the editors of these journals and the, you know, the high metric um, outlet, then use that gatekeeper role to initiate change. I'm an editor of a, a journal myself, and we, I think it's incumbent on us to make difficult choices and, and, and in ways which enable action and enable ways to shift that dynamic in order to start addressing this inequity. Thanks, Charles. Thanks a lot for also giving your take, even though it was following up on Sarah's, you did pretty well, I think. It was some really, really, really important uh, topics from both of you. Uh, uh, that that we as northerners can uh, can take up uh, in the future and discuss on how better to uh, to address um and to uh, sort of uh, mitigate those uh, in imbalances also on the financing and the and the research agendas and knowledge creation so to speak um and i'm glad also charles that you said that not all hope is lost that sort of gives us confidence that uh, that we can uh, that we can bring this to a, to hopefully another level now, Sarah and, thanks, uh, Sarah and Charles, thanks a lot to both of you. Um, we have had a lot of questions coming in, um, and I would like to sort of put them to both of you, actually, um, here before we, uh, we sort of going into the closing stages. And one, of his, one question is that, how do you actually see the African universities and governments, how is their role in leading efforts to address the structural inequalities of power dimensions in these North-South research collaborations? 
Let me pass it to you first, Sarah. Thank you very much. Yes, I think that's a very interesting question that researchers and universities have been pushing for. Um, and I can just give the example of Makere University. I think for one reason for research, first of all, I think global, I mean, you just knowledge producers. I think they do have a political agenda. They believe every university should serve a purpose. And here we, we as Kerry, we should be globally competitive, but locally relevant, and our state demands of that. So what should African, how do African universities and governments see their role in the effort? They see their role in the efforts to address the structural inequality. One, they have to be supportive to the research that is present in universities. We've had this discussion in Uganda and the state of Uganda, our government has res responded by setting up a research fund. It's called the Research and Innovation Fund. It came out of the complaint initially by government that the university was engaging in things which are not relevant to the country. And the researchers were saying our funding is secured from the global north. So it is important that we meet interests of both. And then, of course, the church, the researchers gave to the government, we see us researching more relevant things, please finance us. And the Research and Innovation Fund in Makere has run since 2019. So one thing governments can do is to provide research funding. And right now it's applying to all universities in the country, and there's also a national research fund. Then the other thing governments can do is to communicate where they would need the researchers to pay more attention. In universities, we have what we call research chairs, which most times are set up by either particular foundations or by industry. But now, since we don't have much of industry, but we do have national development plans, what are government priorities? And the universities have positioned themselves to deliver on these priorities very well. But unless they it comes in to support this initiative, it will not work. So government has done a lot to put money in terms of providing research, but also to provide the <clears throat> infrastructure. The governments have to carry the load, the heaviest load, in build, setting up this infrastructure, building the labs, building the classrooms, building whatever it takes, providing security for researchers, making it easy for researchers to access research fields. Many times, one thing we haven't talked about is the whole ethical review process and clearances from national councils of science and technology. So if the government is on board, it should make this process easy for researchers. And maybe lastly, what I can also contribute on is many governments in Africa have ended up into the science arts binary, which has seen actually the arts being defunded. So I think gov governments need to understand the synergies between the arts and humanities and the sciences, because unless they do that, the research, this great science research will be detached from the context. So they need to stop defunding the arts so that the two can be funded together because they are equally important. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah. Really interesting uh, to see, to hear also that actually just by <clears throat> sort of in, increasing the dialogue between the decision makers, governments and researchers and universities that maybe uh, actually can alleviate some of those issues uh, that we're talking about. Charles, do you have anything uh, to add to that, please? One thing to add is there is, of course, this kind of paradox which is is um, present in development working in general and development um, action in, in general, that if there's um, provision of funding from elsewhere, from somewhere else, then it, it disincentivizes the, the making that resource available locally or from inside. And I think that's true of, of development research um, as, as well. So, so there's a bit of a paradox at, at play, but I think that can be overcome. And I think universities in Africa, certainly from my experience, but all over the world, have a role, as Sarah said, in advocacy as well. It's not just the production and support to the research. They can clarify their plans, identify priorities and advocate to government to say, look, this is what we're good at. This is our comparative advantage. This is where we need support. 
And I think that's where then African governments for, um, and, and, and perhaps governments across the global south can try to that more fruitful avenue perhaps is what I discussed around the follow-on or sustainability issue perhaps governments in the global south can't sustain major investment in pure research or experimental research but they might be able to provide resource to the follow-on focus on the translational work partner industry with um, academics to in order to translate and, and extend the value of the research and I think if that can be brought into the early design of grant funding um, the more likely we'll get to more sustainable um, outcomes which African universities and governments can play an important role in. Thank you very much Charles for elaborating on this also bringing in industry linkages uh, into the picture it's really important to have all these uh, dimensions built in, built into it. Thanks a lot to both of you. Now, there's one more question, uh, and maybe Charles, you being the editor of uh, of of a net journal, I maybe pose it to you first. Actually, one is asking: Are there any networks among the African universities that addresses the issue on research collaboration and uh, and the uh, power uh, uh, relations? And if so, do you know which which one is it? Oh, well, I guess, again, I would say I would defer to, to Sarah. She'll probably have better advice on this. But I know that this is something and it should be something which is discussed within the continent and within the regions of, of Africa and, and within each different different country. Um, th this is not a conversation that it's not only for Northerners. My point was trying to speak from that perspective about what can be done from that angle. But I actually believe um, much like development itself, that it, it's that local grassroots mobilization and dialogue and engagement that will lead to the kind of change we want to see here. So while I, I'm not aware of specific networks, um, I think that's a really important avenue to, to try and, 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 and others can support those. Others can help to build the capacity of and support the work of re networks, which, which can lead to that exchange and, and really push in that direction. But, but over to Sarah, maybe on the specifics. Thanks, Charles. Yeah, Sarah, can you, uh, can you uh, enlighten us on, uh, on networks, please? Because I remember also one some of the discussions in Arusha was that uh, that we discussed what do we actually have already existing. Um, so it could be really interesting to elaborate on that. Okay, thank you. I think there are quite a number of African research universities research networks, and most of these are organised around discipline specific things. So I may not know much about what happens in other disciplines, but at least in the humanities, we know of some. But in the interest of time, let me talk about just one continental big network. That's AROA, the African Research Universities Alliance. And uh, to address this kind of thing, it, it the AROA network universities are 17, and the, them have 13 centers of excellence. So the centers of excellence require at least different universities to get together. You cannot get a center of excellence if you are alone. So they get together like hours of identities. We are six universities. And what does this do? We get together, we collaborate, and jointly apply for research funding. And also what the Arua Secretariat then does, it's to source funding opportunities, share funding opportunities with the Arua member universities. The other thing, if you're an Arua member university you're charged with, is to also bring on board other universities that are not members of Arua, that are younger. So every research call you respond to, you have to have the non-Arua network members involved. So there are this kind of, there is African Agricultural Union, there are quite a number of research networks on the continent. So this is one way they are trying to address the issue of capacity through South to South collaboration so that we can put together strong research teams that also merit funding. Because they are, as African universities, we are not demanding for funding with mediocrity. We believe African universities have the capacity to excel. They just don't have the opportunity. So networks like Arua, networks like AAU, networks that are professional are there to help address this situation. And with regard maybe I want small bit I can add on with regard to publications. Many publishing houses these days try to waive publication fees for thousand universities or for thousand
I think that's one way we can say we have to address the inequality. Thank you. Thanks so much, Sarah, for elaborating also on this, and thanks, Charles, for uh, diving into it as well. We have one more uh, one more question, which we maybe don't have time to now, but is not least important. It says, um, "What can we actually do about the trust issue that Sarah that you mentioned and pointed out with regards to the financing?" But maybe that could be even a topic for a follow-up key talk or or another uh, joint venture uh, to discuss these things, bringing uh, bringing funders and, uh, and researchers together. Now we are actually almost at the end of this key talk. But before we say goodbye, uh, Charles, could you please sum up uh, just what are your three main points to keep in mind? when talking and discussing about equitable research partnerships in the global south and the global north. Just three main short points, please. Okay, sure. Well, let me give it a try. I mean, <laughs> I think there's one big point, as I said, that it's about transformational change. And I think all efforts need to be at the least incremental steps towards that transformational change. If we think this requires anything other than that, then we're kidding ourselves. Um, I think though, like I tried to point out, there are things that um, all parts of this partnership can do. There are things that donors can do in terms of shifting the terms and regulations um, for the funding opportunities. There are things that institutional partners in the North can do in terms of using their leverage um, making sacrifices along the way in order to rebalance and reset this relationship. And I think, as I said at the end, most important of all, I think that there are things that those in the global south are doing, are capable of doing, and as Sarah said, already have the capacities to do to some extent um, that need to be mobilized, that need to be coordinated as best as possible to, to build momentum to address that. So I think it's a concerted effort. I think it requires all parts of the partnership to work towards that um, with a real dose of um, both humility, but also realism about the challenge at hand. Thank you so much, Charles. Thanks. And Sarah, if we can hear it from you summing up, just to give us your main three points to remember for a research group uh, consisting of North and South research partners who strive to overcome these in, inbuilt power structures that you've been addressing uh, for achieving a more equitable research partnership, please. Just three main points. Thank you very much, Lars. The first point is that collaborations matter and collaborations are key. Collaborations should be promoted because we live in a global world where we are being combat, bombarded with problems without passports, pandemics, conflict, or environmental disasters. So they, there's a lot of research which you can no longer be pinned to just one place. We are interconnected, so collaborations matter. But for these collaborations to be effective, co-creation is key. Let us get together to the drawing board, come up with research problems together, and see what is going to be important. And I, after co-creation, I think the other thing is opportunity. The things we are discussing, whether we are discussing trust, whether we are discussing capacity of humans or infrastructure, it is all about giving thousand researchers opportunity. Many times we have missed opportunities because we don't have the capacity, but unless we are given the opportunity, how will the capacity be built? So give the Southern researchers an opportunity to handle money, opportunities to deal with high level, to conduct high level research, opportunity now, the gaps are what we should look at strengthening. So collaboration, co-creation, opportunity. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah. Thanks for those three points. And also thanks to both of you. It's been an amazing hour in your company. Um, you've put up so many uh, valid points and really important points to uh, to discuss in the future and for funders and researchers in collaboration to uh, to embark on how to create these more equitable partnerships in our collaborations because it's needed um, definitely. So I'm quite sure that uh, that from here it's uh, it's there's there's work to do from uh, from all sides and especially from us. So thanks a lot, Sarah and Charles, for pointing out out all these things and for uh, for spending an hour in our uh, in our company. 
Thanks also to our participants. As we said in the beginning uh, of this conversation today, actually, it, it, it builds out of, of the science engagement days back in Russia, where we had 50 researchers gathered from actually, I think, more or less 22 universities across Africa, uh, from Asia, from Europe, even from Australia, Charles, you were there also. <laughs> um, so there are, we have some video materials and bench talks uh, on, on the DFC website, and we will post the link uh, for this in the chat. So if you have time and you feel and you're interested in watching these videos, I can really we can recommend highly that you that you uh, that you take a look at uh, at these videos. Um, so this is actually all for today. I'm really sorry that we didn't manage to respond to all the questions. If you have any comments or questions that you like to uh, to put up to us afterwards, you can you can do that by uh, by sending us an email, and the email will also be there now at dfc at dfcenter.dk. And we'll try our best to respond to you uh, by email. We have an, uh, an upcoming Knowledge in Action talk soon, and that will be announced on, a, on our social media platforms and in the DFC newsletter. Of course, you're always welcome to sign up for the DFC newsletter if, in case you haven't uh, yet. So with these few words, I really, really want to thank you. First and foremost, Sarah and Charles, for, for your insight and thoughts today. Excellent. Thank you so much. And thanks to all of you for watching. And just to say, if you have three more minutes to spend uh, now, we will uh, we will show you a short video from the uh, from the engagement days in Arusha, just uh, uh, to see so that you can see what it was what it was actually all about. So that's all for now. Thank you very much from uh, from uh, from all of us at the, the Nita Fellowship Center and Sarah and Charles. And have a good day. Thanks. Global challenges require fact-based knowledge and actions for the world to get sustainable solutions. Collaborative research and knowledge sharing across countries and the continents is gaining more importance. We are gathered here in Tanzania, 50 researchers from 20 research institutions in seven African countries and also six universities from Denmark, one from uh, Australia. We are here to discuss equitable partnerships. Sarah, I always enjoy your presentations. Your presentation about equitable partnerships in hierarchical knowledge system production was extremely useful. Could you summarize uh, how that um, would influence our thinking and the practices as well? Beyond the knowledge being researched about is a whole set of power relations. Those power relations are evident when we are doing the direct research, but they're also evident in what we decide to research on. They are also evident in the method we use because for long, the Global South and Africa in particular have been considered as simply consumers of secondary knowledge, not producers of their own knowledge. So if we are to be producers of our own knowledge, we cannot just continue mimicking what the West has done. We cannot just continue being native informers of what happens in the African context. We have to go further and produce primary knowledge. Associate Professor Charles, you facilitated a session financing research projects. What are the implications? What often happens when we look at development research partnerships is we have um, strong narratives and supportive comments around equity and, and justice. But when we drill down and look into the financial aspects, the budgeting, financial reporting, the accountability back to donors. That's where we see the power differential play out upon those in the South. Setting a research agenda is such an important issue in these collaborative partnerships. Um, and you just facilitated a session about this area. So what are the main takeaways? First of all is understanding what determines the core areas. Okay. Key. Mm -hmm facilitating social engagement between African researchers and Northern researchers, mm. and then bringing Afrocentric theories into the equation 
authorship between North and South researchers. Why is this topic of importance? For an author to be part of a publication, that author, whether it's from the North or from the South, have to work together. When you conduct research, the end result is a publication, and that's a joint activity. Consul, you presented about uh, messiness of the colonization and the complexities of everyday mentalism in Tanzania. What uh, can we learn from, from your project? Our main focus is to try to deconstruct and challenge the notions that humanitarianism has been perceived as um, um, a state-centric, north-to-south um, responses to crises that happen in the southern context. But in our research, we are trying to give power and urgency and uh, try to understand what ordinary people in their localities, in their everyday life, respond to crises such as floods, such as earthquake, before this formal humanitarian assistance arrives. Muted mutual learning in research. Why is that important? Mutual learning is uh, uh, actually recognitions of each other's source of knowledge and uh, knowledge systems we should include uh, the communities. So it is not only about the researchers to researchers, but also learning with the inclusions of the communities, plus all other stakeholders. We have had very useful and important discussions in these two days about um, uh, partnerships in research and a lot of recommendations have been given. Mutual learning should be deliberate right from the beginning of the partnership and issues such as publication should be discussed early enough. And another area is financing, which is crucial for research. In financing, we discuss about how to reduce uh, inequities. First is to recognize the resources, but also the capacity of South partners. The second is to um, engage the government, because also we think thirdly that it is important um, to reduce dependence of South partners to the North. Under authorship, we discussed that researchers should be able to publish in open access journals to enable access for the South researchers. But we also discussed about um, research agenda, the setting of research agenda. And it is critically important that both South and North partners start discussions about research agenda from the beginning of uh, their partnership. For me personally, these two days have been so important and so beneficial. And I hope that we'll continue with such meetings in the future. And you? Um, I fully agree, and uh, the two days have made me think a lot. As a South uh, researcher, I need to make contribution to knowledge while also um, ensuring that the partnership remains equal. The lopsided relationship between the Global North and South needs to be restructured. Northern researchers need to make deliberate choices to cite Southern journals if we want to change the narrative around what is a good journal. Capacity building is good, but you need infrastructure to actualize the benefits of capacity building. Otherwise, you'll be training for people to leave the continent.